Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. It is the night of July the 4th, and they do it up right here in West San Jose. So you might hear fireworks in the background, right? My neighborhood is committed to blowing up fireworks, and I'm all for it. July 4th is that special, right? Let me also point out, too, this is really a historical video. There is a great article on BoxingScene.com on what I consider to be the most important sporting event, at least in American history, right? It's one of my absolute favorite moments in sports. It involves my favorite athlete in history, and that's Jack Johnson, right? And it's a shame that we don't fully appreciate Johnson uh, for all he did and the way he carried himself. I know we'll disagree on this. My dad loved Joe Lewis. I know there's a crowd out there that loved Jesse Owens. For me, it starts and ends with Jack Johnson. On this day in 1910, Jack Johnson fought Jim Jeffries, the Great White Hope. That's a moment in time. But let's talk about another fight that took place on July 4th, right? This also involved another personal favorite. This fight took place in Toledo, Ohio. At the time, the champion was Jess Willard, the man who beat Jack Johnson. And let me just say, they found the film of the fight, believe it or not, in the 60s. These, fights, these fight films went underground in part because of Johnson's victory over Jim Jeffries, it was illegal to transport these films interstate. And let's just say Willard, using a long jab, beats Jack Johnson. That fight's not a thrown fight, right? That fight went 26 rounds. Um, just understand, I know Johnson hits the canvas, then covers up his eyes, but Johnson is getting methodically beaten in that fight. And Jess Willard at the time was six foot six and of course he had killed a man in a boxing match he hit a guy named bull young with an uppercut and folks it broke young's neck at the time boxing was a outlaw sport so believe it or not jess willard got tried for murder and he had to defend himself in court against criminal charges. Fortunately, he was able to win that case. So understand, on July the 4th, 1919, he takes on a guy who officially weighed 58 pounds less than him. Right? This is a guy who believe it or not, got knocked out in less than a minute by fireman Jim Flynn, a guy who had fought for the heavyweight title twice, right? Lost to Tommy Burns, lost to Jack Johnson. He then fights a young, early 20s Jack Dempsey and destroys him, right? Dempsey claims he got caught before he could get into the fight. Now, Dempsey at 6'1", which is bigger than the Galveston giant, Jack Johnson. Dempsey here is outweighed by 58 pounds, and he's the shorter man by at least 5 inches. Right? Understand that Dempsey enters the fight on a streak of 5 knockouts in the first round. Right? That's how Dempsey fights for the heavyweight title. And just understand, Jess Willard knew, this was Dempsey's reputation, that Dempsey was likely to run across the ring. And that Dempsey was going to be hardcore in that first round. And here's the quote from Willard before the fight takes place. He says, he'll come tearing at me. But I'm 70, 80 pounds heavier than the boy. That's right. Willard is calling Dempsey a boy before the fight. He says, I'll have my left out. 
he'll have to watch for my left when he's tearing in at me. Then I'll hit him with a right uppercut. That will be the end. Right now, understand, this fight has a lot of questions. You need to understand, <laughs> boxing was a different sport back then. Jack Dempsey is one of the sport's most controversial figures in history. Right? Understand, Jack Dempsey hung around mobsters. Right? Jack Dempsey, one time, according to legend, is leaving someplace in L.A. and four guys attack him in what looks like a targeted hit. The heavyweight champion turns around, beats up two of them, the other two run away. Right? Even later in his life, there's a story of Jack Dempsey well into his 70s. This is out of Arthur McConty's uh, boxing memoir. Dempsey, of course, the night of the Ali Fraser fight, if you believe legend, gets into a scuffle with two young guys who are trying to rob an old man, him. And, of course, Dempsey subdues both of them. Dempsey would later talk to Mercanti. Dempsey at the time owned a restaurant in Manhattan. He was part of the boxing cognizante in New York City. And he said to Arthur Mercanti, look, you know, I can't go for long, but I can still punch a little. Right after he subdued two young guys in their 20s. Well, understand the beating that Jack Dempsey puts on Jess Willard has called has caused some to call the fight crooked right Willard supposedly after this fight had a busted jaw lost hearing in one ear had several shattered ribs had a broken cheekbone had a ton of bruising right this is 1919 both fighters were using five-ounce gloves. Now, Willard went into the fight against a guy weighing more than 50 pounds less than him, having never been knocked down. Jack Dempsey drops him seven times in the first round. Now, Ali's doctor, who used to be a celebrity in boxing, in fact, with Marv Albert, he would actually uh, announce fights. He would be the commentator. They called him the ring doctor, Ferdy Pacheco. In a book years later, he had the opinion that the surviving photographs of Jess Willard's face after the Dempsey fight indicates that Willard suffered fractures to his facial bones, suggesting a metal implement which caused Willard to bleed heavily. Right In his book, The Twelve Greatest Rounds of Boxing, on pages 17 to 18, the fight doctor wrote the following. The damage was indeed severe. In the first round, Willard's zyromatic arch, his cheekbone, was shattered in 12 places. In the same round, the champion sustained a broken nose, a jaw that was broken in 13 places, and ate a false teeth. In addition to facial fractures, he suffered two fractured ribs. Right? Dr. Pacheco also wrote, I've been a physician in boxing for 40 years, and I have never seen such anatomical damage as Jack Dempsey inflicted on Jess Willard. Now, let me point out that after the first round, Dempsey's group was so excited they left the ring. The fight hadn't been called. According to fight protocol, Dempsey would have then had 60 seconds to get back in the ring. Right? He just knocked the champion down seven times. Willard is saved by the bell. We now have the film of the fight. We know that the timing was off. In other words, Jack Dempsey should have won the fight by KO in the first round, right? The round goes a little bit long. Dempsey and his crowd 
hop out the ring thinking Jack Dempsey is the heavyweight champion. Now, believe it or not, even though he had a guarantee of $100,000, Jess Willard was a cheapskate. He had some guys in his corner who were not very experienced. Right? They did not know to file an official protest based on the fact that Dempsey does not make it back into the ring within the 60-second time period allotted. Folks, this fight is a weird fight. Well, Dempsey gets back in the ring and is allowed to continue to fight. Now, here's the question. And the temperature, of course, is over 100 degrees. Right? Should Dempsey have been disqualified in a fight where he should have been awarded a first-round knockout? The conspiracy theorists have another point. The fight goes two more rounds, the second and the third. Given that Jack Dempsey knocks down Willard seven times in the first round, why wasn't he able to drop Willard in the second and third rounds? Right now, understand, they did Jack Dempsey wrong here. Right? Willard, of course, after the fight, claimed that Dempsey's gloves weren't loaded but that Dempsey was carrying something in his gloves, right? This is Willard's version of what he believes happened, right? Willard believes that Dempsey had a metal bolt in the palm of his glove attached to the thumb sideways. Willard maintained this until his death in the late 60s, right? Willard's team, saw the bolt drop from Dempsey's glove, and Willard showed it to a reporter in the 1960s before his death. Right? This is years after the fight, decades after the fight. Willard claimed to have the metal bolt that dropped from Dempsey's hand. Right now, Dempsey hit so hard, folks. This is not the only fight in which there's a claim that Dempsey was holding something. Research the Lewis Firpo fight. Ironically, Firpo would fight Jess Willard. The two guys would fight each other. Two guys who, you know, had fights with Dempsey where there are claims that Dempsey was carrying something. Understand, Dempsey gets knocked out of the ring in the Firpo fight. Right? And Firpo, you should know this, beat Jess Willard. Just food for thought. Well, let me just say this. So Jack Kearns, Dempsey's manager, in the 1960s, right? It's the January 13th, 1964 edition of Sports Illustrated. Gave an interview where he claimed that Dempsey did not know that his gloves were loaded. Now keep in mind, Willard's take is that Dempsey has a metal bolt in his glove, right? Not inside the glove, but he's holding it in the palm of his glove. That's Willard's claim. You have Dempsey's manager who, of course, fell out with Dempsey. And keep in mind, Dempsey is a cash cow, even by Canelo and Anthony Joshua, even by Canelo and Anthony Joshua standards. But yet, Dempsey ultimately goes bankrupt. So does Jack Kearns. Right? There's no telling where the money went. Well, let's just say this. Jack Kearns confesses to Sports Illustrated that, here's the quote, I had bet $10,000, which we could not afford to lose, at 10 to 1, that Dempsey would win in the first round. If he did, we would make $100,000, the equivalent to Willard's guarantee and substantially more than our own $27,500 guarantee. I had schemed and connived for too many years to let anything go wrong with a bet like that, let alone with the championship of the world. The hell with being a gallant loser. I intended to win. This is Dempsey's own manager. 
in the 60s to Sports Illustrated to address all the rumors about the fight. He continued, My plan had to do with a small white can sitting innocently among the fight gear on the kitchen table. I poured myself a nightcap and picked up the can, grinning at the neat blue letters on its side. All it said was talcum powder. I had bought another can of powder. This one was labeled Plaster of Paris. I placed the Plaster of Paris into the talcum powder can and replaced the lid. Set back among the fight gear, the bandages, the Vaseline, the razor blades, the cotton, it looked as innocent as any of them. Right now, that's the claim that Kearns has, that Dempsey's rap is loaded with plaster of Paris. Now, let's talk about why that could not be so. Let's talk about why, quite frankly, Dempsey's own manager is doing him a disservice, right? There's a weakness to each camp, even in 1919 that observed the hand wraps, the wrapping of the hands, right? Just to understand, Willard's chief second, Walter Monahan, was in Dempsey's dressing room to observe the proceedings. He saw Dempsey's hands getting wrapped. Now, according to Kearns, this is how he got around. Willard's second, watching Dempsey's hand get wrapped. According to Kearns, I quickly wound on Dempsey's bandages under Moynihan's village inspection. No. Hold on one second. Hey, love, don't say anything, okay? I'm, I'm making a video. After I finished with the wrappings, I turned to Jimmy DeForest, my trainer, and pointed to the water bucket. Give me that sponge well soaked with water I ordered. I want to keep the kid's hands cool. The sponge dripping with water made a sloshing sound as I clamped it to the bandages on Dempsey's hands. In a moment, they were drenched through. Now the talcum powder. I directed to Forrest, and he passed me the innocent-looking can. I sprinkled the contents heavily over the bandages. Moynihan made no comment. Dempsey, who was entirely innocent of what had happened, stood there in almost a stupor. I had to smile as a call came to enter the ring. Right now, I need for folks to understand this is 1919. Back then, the boxers entered the ring without their gloves on. They entered the ring with their hand wraps, apparent. Right, Kearns is giving this version of events to Sports Illustrated in the 60s, a different time, right? Is Kearns' version of events even realistic in 1919? And let me just point out that it's not. There are photos of Jack Dempsey and his hand wraps in the ring. He enters the ring with his hand wraps visible. Right? So understand, this current story from 1964 is a disgruntled former manager upset that he fell out with his fighter and trying to come up with a story that would undercut how Jack Dempsey, a great heavyweight, really, in my opinion, the first modern heavyweight champion. We're not talking about other divisions. This is really a story to discredit Jack Dempsey. Let me also point out, too, there's a question, and I know we're post-Antonio Margarito. More importantly, we're post the Margarito Cotto fight. That's an important fight. Because understand, before Margarito gets busted using Plaster of Paris, in the Shane Mosley fight, right? Just to understand, he fights Miguel Cotto, and Cotto's face explodes to such an extent that Cotto, after the fight, thought that Margarito's gloves were loaded. Right? Google Cotto's comments 
after the Margarito fight. They fought again. And Cotto is diplomatic, right? Cotto is one of these natural boxing ambassadors. Think Alexis Arguello, right? But Cotto, in the face-to-face, -face, sit down with Antonio Margarito, makes it clear. Makes it clear. He even brings his own tablet to the interview that he didn't feel that he was hit with real shots. Now understand, that fight's important to me personally because I was on a couch wearing a t-shirt. I made a video for what I thought were a few friends. I made a prediction that Margarito would be Cotto. Folks, that led to the YouTube presence I have, believe it or not. Right? It's embarrassing to look at that video. It's just me in a t-shirt. I thought maybe a few friends would look at it. Maybe some other boxing people would wander into the YouTube video. Well, just understand, Margarito was busted with Plaster of Paris. And there is an open question. It's an open question on whether you can set up your hands so that Plaster of Paris hardens during the fight and inflicts the kind of damage that Jack Dempsey inflicted on Jess Willard. Let me also point out, too, that Boxing Illustrated did a, an experiment involving Big Cat, Cleveland Williams, very important heavyweight from the 60s, where they did what Doc Kearns claims he did, sprinkled stuff on the gloves, um, on the um, wrapping, after putting water on the wrapping, and they found that it was ineffective. The plaster of Paris didn't form properly. You ended up with chunks inside the glove that didn't help punching power. Right? Well, let me just say what really happened. What does the evidence show us? Right? Is Dempsey holding a metal spike as Willard thinks he was, a metal bolt? Are his hand wraps tampered to have plaster of Paris on them? Does Dempsey drop a metal bolt at any time during the fight? Is Dempsey holding his hands in such a way where there is even a possibility that he's holding something in his gloves? Well, let's go back through history. Let's talk about the evidence we know of. The films clearly show Dempsey entering the ring without the gloves on. He just has his wraps. That brings us to the first possibility. Were Dempsey's hand wraps loaded with plaster of Paris? The answer is no. There is a photo of Dempsey sitting in his corner with his hand wraps. You have a clear view of the hand wraps. Folks, there's no foreign substance on them. Let me also make a point, too. If you are going to cheat and put plaster of Paris on the hand wraps, would you allow photos to be taken of them? Let's continue. You can imagine a heavyweight fight with more than 100,000 people was going to attract a lot of people. One of them was Nate Fleischer, right, who would later become a big wig in boxing, right, the head of Ring Magazine. And he watched Dempsey's hands getting wrapped, right? Doc Kearns was not the person who wrapped them. Understand, we know the Kearns story is bogus because there were people there in the room when Dempsey's hands were getting wrapped. It's the trainer DeForest who wrapped the hands, not Kearns. Let me also point out, too, that in terms of cutting off Dempsey's wraps, who did that? It's not Kearns there either. It's a guy named Teddy Hayes. We know this. So we know the Kern story is fake. Serious fight fans need to put that story to bed. Here is Teddy Haynes's quote. I snipped it right in front of a whole milling room, a uh, milling crowd in the dressing room. Don't you think if there was plaster of Paris, 
Kearns would have been their standing guard. And you can't cut off plaster of Paris with scissors. I would have had to have had a hacksaw. Historian J.J. Johnson puts the nail in the coffin on the plaster of Paris theory. Right, by the way, this should tell you the type of puncher that Jack Dempsey was. Right, multiple fights where people think he's holding a spike or must have had plaster of Paris. Understand, the films show that when the champion, according to historian J.J. Johnson, when Willard himself enters the ring, he walks over to Jack Dempsey and examines his hands. Again, at the time, Dempsey doesn't have gloves on. Willard has a direct view of Dempsey's hands. That should end any argument that there's any plaster of Paris on Dempsey's wraps. Now let me make a few other points here. Now I'm a Jack Johnson fan, but Jack Johnson is bringing defense to the party and clinching to the party. You look at the Jeffries fight and Jeffries is trying to come inside on Johnson and Johnson's able to just clinch him on demand. In fact, the better fight for this is the Tommy Burns Johnson fight where Burns, a smaller man, keeps coming inside and Burns was a big puncher. Burns keeps jumping inside on Jack Johnson who clinches him. Right? That's what Johnson brings to the party. Jess Willard is a long jab. And of course, this deadly uppercut with incredible stamina. Right? And size. He's six inches taller than Jack Johnson. But yet there he is in the 26th round of that Johnson fight. And he's able to control Johnson with this jab and throw big punches behind it. Now Jack Dempsey brings a different dynamic to the party. This is the Bob and Weaver with lateral movement. I want you to think of two guys in history. These are the two who really are Jack Dempsey disciples. One is the great Smoking Joe Fraser. Right, Smoking Joe, when I became aware of boxing, the champion was a dominant one. He was Smoking Joe Fraser. People expected Smoking Joe to beat George Foreman. Right, Smoking Joe had gone through, you know, Jerry Quarry, countless guys. Right, compare and contrast. Bob Foster, and I have the Ali Bob Foster highlights in my favorites folder here on YouTube. Compare and contrast Ali against Bob Foster, one of the legendary light heavyweight champions, Hall of Famer, with Bob Foster against Joe Fraser, recognizing that Fraser didn't weigh much more than Bob Foster. Right? And Joe Fraser bobbed and weaved. You didn't quite know where Joe was in the ring. Then Joe would pop up with one of boxing's best left hooks. The other fighter is Mike Tyson. Now, let me tell you about Tyson's relationship with Jack Dempsey. Tyson wore black trunks in the ring because his idol, Jack Dempsey, wore black trunks in the ring. Right? Tyson is a Jack Dempsey expert. Dempsey's one of Mike Tyson's favorite fighters. A lot of what Jack Dempsey does, Mike Tyson emulated. So understand, you have Jack Dempsey putting his hand inside of Willard's right hand to make sure Willard cannot throw that right uppercut of his. Understand, Dempsey would be moving, right? I'm telling you, this movement is new to the heavyweight division. Dempsey would be moving, then his feet would be almost parallel to his opponent's feet. And Dempsey would unload with both hands. Also, Dempsey, like Tyson, or I should say Tyson, like Dempsey, didn't want fights going into the later rounds. So understand, Dempsey has a five 
fight KO streak in the first round headed into the Willard fight, then drops the heavyweight champ seven times in the first round. Right? It's sudden. Now understand, this is different than Marciano. Right? Marciano, another smaller heavyweight. Now keep in mind, Dempsey's not small. He's 6'1". He's actually bigger than Jack Johnson by half an inch. Right? Just to understand, for the time, for 1919, Dempsey's not small. But understand, we look at Dempsey's ferocity, and then we compare it to, you know, let's say a Rocky Marciano. You know, at the time, they used to say, Marciano had two left feet. Marciano didn't move as well as Joe Fraser or as Mike Tyson. Right? Understand, those guys, think of Tyson against Marvis Fraser. Marvis has no place to go. Folks, that's the first round. Right? That's the first round of the fight. Right? Marciano was more, lethodic, uh, was more methodical. Jack Dempsey is urgent. Right? This is a big shift. If you're looking at heavyweight champs, this is one of the biggest shifts in heavyweight history. Going from 6'6", Jess Willard, to cat quick, bob and weave, two-handed, Jack Dempsey. Right? Let's continue here. The fight's not what you expect. Dempsey doesn't jump across the ring and jump on Jess Willard. Believe it or not, he's measured the first minute. Not much happens. Dempsey comes in and he's an angles guy at the end of the day. Dempsey comes in and he's figuring out the angles. He figures out how to clinch Willard. Right? He, he is too mobile for Jess Willard. He's too mobile for Willard's long jab. So then he strikes. Right? After a Slow beginning. He doesn't run across the ring. After a slow beginning, Dempsey backloads the round with seven knockdowns. Now let me uh, point out that the first knockdown comes off a of Dempsey left hook. Willard never recovers. Willard had never hit the canvas before. He hits the canvas what happens after that, and we've watched boxing long enough here, is that Willard is semi-conscious. The Willard people want you to believe that seven knockdowns is unusual. Not if you're semi-conscious. I want people to look at George Foreman against Ken Norton. Right? Once Kenny hits the canvas, folks, I mean, Kenny's, Kenny's finished. Right? <laughs> Kenny's in front of a puncher. That's what happens here. Now let's talk about the best argument that skeptics have who claim that Jack Dempsey cheated. In the July 3rd, 1979, Los Angeles Times. And folks, yes, this controversy has gone on for decades. Joe Stone, a boxing historian, made the case that there is film of something that could have been the alleged iron bolt that Jack Dempsey carried in his left hand, supposedly, on the canvas, right? There's a still photo of something on the canvas. If you believe the folklore, someone from Dempsey's corner then walks over to that spot and then it disappears from the film right here's the problem this is 1919 a lot of guys smoked back then right a lot of guys smoked back then you had something called a cigar what appears in the still photo is indistinguishable from a cigar it looks like a cigar more than anything else. Right? And so, 
A skeptic's going to say, look, we have it on film. You have what on film? I would argue that that photo shows a cigar. Right? Just food for thought. Let me just say, too, I'm going to read the portion of the stone piece where he tries to make it sound like the Dempsey Corner gets rid of this item on the canvas. Right? The idea is that this item drops out after the first round. That explains why Dempsey can't drop Willard in the second and third round. He says, now watch this, Stone says. Look at this guy. He points to a man walking from the area of Dempsey's corner to the spot where Willard had just arisen. While Dempsey's handlers are jumping up and down for joy in the ring, the fellow climbs into the ring at the neutral corner. He stands directly over the dark object on the apron. A fan stands covering the view of the man's feet, but after a few seconds he walks away, the fan sits down, and the dark object is gone. See that, Stone said? I think he kicked it off the apron. I think Jack Dempsey had a load in his glove. Now, let's point out a few things. Right? Stone makes the argument that if you assume that the dark object is a load, then that explains the fact that Willard stays on his feet in the second and third rounds. The argument, too, is that it's Dempsey's left hand that's loaded. If you look at Willard, the damage to Willard, most of it is on the right side of Willard's face. The argument is that you don't have this damage off the multitude of shots thrown by Dempsey's right hand. Right? Let me also point out too that the idea of a corner man Entering the ring between rounds from a neutral corner is unusual. As Stone puts it, I've been around boxing for 25 years and I never saw a corner man enter the ring from a neutral corner. Right? But I need for folks to understand that Dempsey's entire corner leaves the ring. Right? Dempsey barely makes it back into the ring for round two. A lot of unusual things happen then, right? Let me also just say, did Dempsey use an iron bolt in his glove? Just understand that the information people are relying on is inaccurate, right? First, let's talk about Willard's injuries. At the beginning of this video, I talked about how Willard supposedly had his jaw broken in multiple places, how he supposedly had problems with eight of his teeth. Now, that's according to Ferdy Pacheco. People see this and they say, well, Pacheco's a doctor. How could Pacheco have bad information? Right now, let me just point out, this is 1919. Boxing at the time is a bit of an outlaw sport. You don't have all these state boxing commissions, right? You, you don't have the centralized body with a lot of power that you have now in these sanctioning bodies. What I want people to realize is that the report of Willard suffering these injuries came from a non-doctor. Right? Just understand that a guy named Jim Byrne was called the official physician to a local athletic club in, in Toledo. Right? They put this fight together where the, you know, physician didn't have a medical degree. Right? Just, just understand that, you know, this guy is supposed to have just been some guy working in a local athletic club. A lot of the 
post-fight reports were really designed to make the fight sound as salacious as possible, to draw the sports world's attention to the match. Right now, we know that things were reported at the time that contradict the idea that Jess Willard has, you know, something wrong with a teeth, has a multiple fractured jaw. So, there's an interview. It's done on July 7th, three days after the fight, right? The Kansas City Times had an article that talked about Jess Willard and his wife leaving Toledo and driving their car back to Lawrence, Kansas that day. The article noted that Willard's condition seemed to be fine. The swelling over his left eye had entirely disappeared, and the only mark he bore was a slight discoloration over the eye and the lip. Now, this is an article entitled, Willard Starts for Home. You have the archives of the Kansas City Times. It's the July 8, 1919 edition at page 10. There's more. Believe it or not, there's an article that's written the day of the fight, July 4th, from the New York Times. Right now, just understand, if your jaw has been broken in 13 places, you would have a hard time speaking. Jess Willard gave a post-fight interview. That July 5th, 1919 New York Times article, right? The fight takes place on the 4th. He gives the interview on the 4th. It comes out the next day, right? The July 5th, 1919 New York Times quoted Willard as saying, Dempsey is a remarkable hitter. It was the first time that I have ever been knocked off my feet. I have sent many birds home in the same bruised condition that I am in, and now I know how they felt. I sincerely wish Dempsey all the luck possible and hope that he garnishes all the riches that comes with the championship. I have had my fling with the title. I was champion for four years, and I assure you that they'll never have to give a benefit for me. I have invested the money I have made. Right, folks, that's Willard, supposedly with a jaw broken all over the place. Right, Willard himself refers to his condition as only bruised. Right now, let me just say this. There are other good reasons to doubt that Dempsey was holding anything in his glove. Besides the false and exaggerated medical report from the fight physician who didn't have a medical degree. These are best summed up by historian Stan Smith, who makes the following observations. I pulled my 16 millimeter film of the fight, and in the first part of round one, before the first knockdown, Dempsey moved around the ring with open gloves. He has his hands this way, right? Open gloves. The spike would have made a hell of a clunk when it hit the ring floor. He also used open gloves with both hands on Willard's arm to push him out of clinches. After the first knockdown, Dempsey held the top rope with his left hand. The left is the hand that's supposed to be juiced. How is Dempsey supposedly with a metal bolt in his hand holding the top rope with the same hand? Right, and so Smith continues and says, after one of the other knockdowns, he did the same thing with his right hand. So much for the iron spike theory. Right, so just understand a few things. Right, you have VIPs, Benny Leonard, legendary lightweight, is at the fight. Right, you have VIPs in the room when Dempsey's hands are being wrapped. They're not wrapped by Kearns. That 1964 Sports Illustrated article is just a bunch of crap. They're not wrapped by him. 
Dempsey enters the ring with the wraps visible. Willard comes across the ring when he enters and looks at the wraps. There's nothing on the wraps. Willard himself doesn't believe there's plaster of Paris on the wraps. Willard's story has Dempsey holding a metal rod. Right, a metal bolt. During the fight, Dempsey, who spends the opening part of the fight like a modern fighter would. In other words, Dempsey's moving around, seeing how Willard moves. Dempsey comes inside, makes sure he can clinch Willard. Right, Dempsey has his hands visible. Nobody sees anything in his hand. Right, folks, the, the story trying to discredit Dempsey's performance in which he gains the heavyweight title, it's bogus. Right, there's no plaster of Paris. There's nothing in Dempsey's hand. The thing on the canvas could easily have been a cigar. So understand, in the 60s, when Willard is sitting down and talking with someone, and he goes and reaches for a metal bolt, and he has that metal bolt, and he has a story about how it fell from Dempsey's glove. That story's fake. Let me point out, Dempsey fights Gene Tunney twice. Right? Dempsey never gives Jess Willard a rematch in a fight that Dempsey dominates. I believe the reason Dempsey doesn't is because after he beat this man fair and square, Jess Willard then comes up with this ridiculous story to talk about how he was badly beaten based on a fictitious medical report after the fight and conveniently overlooks the fact that the Kansas City Times, the New York Times, met with him after the fight. And they didn't see a guy whose jaw is busted in 13 places. Um, Ferdy Pacheco talks about how he had two ribs broken. Right? Now, folks, understand, the folklore on the fight has him with more broken ribs than that. Right? Just food for thought. Let me also point out, too, in the 1980s, it was shocking. And I mean this. It was shocking when you saw Mike Tyson running through fighters like Trevor Burbeck. Right? It, it looked bizarre because we had been trained for years watching people like Larry Holmes, right? Uh, Michael Spinks at light heavyweight. We had been trained for years that boxers needed to come in with jabs and work slowly and be methodical, break down an opponent. That's what we were taught. Then here was Mike Tyson, Jack Dempsey devotee. Customato had him watching historical greats back then. This is before the net. Tyson's looking at historical films. The first person I heard talk about the great Benny Leonard who was the standard for years at lightweight, was Mike Tyson, right? Tyson, quite frankly, makes a great boxing analyst. He used to do fights occasionally. He's excellent, right? Tyson came across the ring like Jack Dempsey and even a champion like Trevor Burbeck. Look up that fight. Was absolutely astonished. Right? I believe what happened is that 6'6 Jess Willard was accustomed to people treating him like a giant. They were accustomed to tiptoeing around him. And here is Dempsey in the heavyweight division. This is new. Dempsey comes in with lateral movement. and Dempsey had this thing where he's kind of like ducking, not like Joe Fraser. Fraser had a kind of like, you know, twitch type thing he was working on. Dempsey's more subtle, right? Dempsey comes in and he's dipping his head and he's moving like this. I don't think Willard, in an era where 
they didn't have videotapes or digital tapes like we have now. You couldn't just get boxing videos. Understand too, even the big fights after Johnson Jeffries, you couldn't transport these championship videos across state lines, right? Understand you had a lot of brothers in the sport, right? The great Sam Langford beats Fireman Flynn twice, right? You had, at a time of Jim Crow, you had interracial boxing matches. So the films of these matches were taboo, right? Understand the era when Jack Johnson wins the heavyweight title from Tommy Burns, we don't even have film of that part of the round. Even though the fight was filmed, they were instructed to shut down the cameras so that we wouldn't have film footage. It's the same reason why you don't have the first pitch to Jackie Robinson on film. Right? And that's 47. So just understand, Jess Willard didn't have access, in my opinion, to films of Jack Dempsey, who's an outlier. So Dempsey comes across the ring and is bobbing and weaving and has a lot of lateral movement and is going for the knockout in the first round. And even though Willard understood that Dempsey had a five-fight first-round knockout streak, I believe he was shell-shocked when he saw the smaller man moving side to side, comes in, clinches him. I don't, I don't think Willard could process Jack Dempsey's foot speed, which was much faster than Jack Johnson's foot speed. Johnson is the best person who Willard had faced before the Jack Dempsey fight. So understand, Jack Dempsey treated poorly by Ferdy Pacheco, <laughs> treated poorly by Jess Willard, quite frankly, uh, after legitimately beating Jess Willard to get the World Heavyweight Championship. And of course, because the Great Depression rolls out at the end of the 20s, a lot of people lost money. Dempsey himself becomes a boxing referee to pay, to pay bills. Right, think about that. Fortunately, his restaurant takes off for him. But Dempsey's supplementing his income. Right, goes bankrupt. Another one of Dempsey's problems was multiple wives. Right, just, just understand, he has a bad falling out with his manager. And I believe that's the reason why the manager in the mid-60s, in 64, decides to give a fake interview a demonstratively fake interview to Sports Illustrated, right? Let's not kid ourselves, folks. Dempsey is a great, right? He loses to Gene Tunney. I believe Tunney uh, was a master boxer whose style just fit Jack Dempsey, right? The long count, that's another fight. Maybe we'll do a different video on that fight, right? But just understand, Tunney, had a problem with Harry Greb, who beat him. Right? Tunney had a problem with volume. So Tunney understood that he needed to take the volume away from Jack Dempsey. Now, just like with Mike Tyson, who the world caught up with, right? Tyson has problems with Buster Douglas. Understand, Bone Crusher Smith is able to hug Mike Tyson. Razor Ruddick gives Tyson a couple of tough fights. The world eventually in the 20s catches up with Jack Johnson. But understand, the only man to knock down Jack Johnson was Fireman Flint. <laughs> Interesting person, Fireman Flint, right? And he does so in something like 25 seconds. Dempsey in 1919 was just too off the grid for slow measured fighters. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. It's July 4th, 1919. Jack Dempsey becomes heavyweight champion. Look, I'm not saying this fight means as much to me personally 
as July 4th, 1910. Right, but let's just say if we're all historians here, given that July 4th, 1910 has been talked about by others, including myself, in other videos, right, let's focus on another great fight in heavyweight history. Jack Dempsey outweighed by more than 50 pounds, knocking down Jess Willard seven times in the first round, right? Willard does not come out for the fourth. Let me just say, I know there are those who say, hey, Sonny Liston lost his title on the stool to Cassius Clay. Folks, he's not the first, right? Jess Willard does not answer the bell for the fourth round. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.